Hi, I'm Jonathan Jay, and welcome to Dealmakers TV, where I meet and interview professional dealmakers, people who buy businesses for a living, and professional advisors, people who should be part of your business buying deal team. I want to show you the tactics and the strategies, the tips and the tricks that will make your next acquisition more successful. Today I'm talking to Graham Carling, who bought construction company McGill's out of administration. Now his friends and family warned him off, so the first question is, was it a good idea after all? Graham, was it? Well, that's a great question. Um, for me, yes, absolutely, it was a great idea. Um, I think the the business that McGill was and can be again just gives gave us a great opportunity to acquire a business that uh, had gone into administration. Um, it had stopped trading only for a few weeks before we started getting the, the whole thing going again. And um, we really, after a few, it took about three or four months to really get the thing, really get some momentum behind it. And uh, now we are, you know, we're, we're on the brink of oh, it's almost 12 months since the company went into administration. And I'm delighted where we're at. I think uh, um, I'm always looking for more, but I think we've proved a few people wrong uh, in uh, what we've done over the last 12 months. So for me, answer is a, a categoric yes where I sit today. So for people who aren't familiar with the company, just give us an idea, idea of the scale of it, how many people it employed. Yeah. That sort of thing. So McGill was a Scottish top 500 company, um, employed 440 staff uh, throughout Scotland. Um, it, a few years ago, done about 60, 65 million of turnover. The year before it went into administration, around about 45 million. A lot of government contracts, a lot of uh, large construction projects it was involved in right across Scotland. So it was a big big deal. When McGill went into administration, you know, it was real high profile in Scotland and uh, not just uh, due to the workforce loss in Dundee where, where its head office is based and where I'm based, but um, it did cover a wide scope uh, throughout Scotland. So, I mean, it was it was high profile. It was at gov uh, Scottish government level and um, there was a, you know, there was a bit of an outcry when it went into administration. Yeah. So how did you find out about this opportunity then? Well, it was an interesting one, this one, because um, we'd actually looked at McGill 18 months before it went into administration. We'd made an approach via their auditors at the time. We were on the lookout for a platform business with which to enter the sector to, uh, and, and McGill was identified as a business that gave us, that had enough scope and platform and was well known had been established long enough, uh, we felt that would have been a, a good one to, to start talking to. It didn't get anywhere. And um, uh, probably the month before it went into administration, I received a phone call out the blue from the auditor asking if I'd like to go along for a meeting. I did. Nothing was disclosed at that meeting, but I kind of got the the feeling that something might be in the offing. But I was I was in the US, I, I was down in London, uh, I flew back to London, then I got a phone call saying, look, can you come up and have a meeting? But by the time I got up there, I think it was too far gone. Mm -hmm. So it was going into administration, although it hadn't been cast in stone, but there was rumours going about that was going to happen. And the, I mean, and the whole irony of it was the day, which was the 1st of February 2019, McGill went into administration. I was sat in a hotel with my wife and a lawyer, a way to view a, a property that we were, that we've actually subsequently bought, actually. Um, we were looking at a property acquisition and the administrators and the staff of McGill all turned up and descended at this hotel and that was them going into administration. So it was almost by fate we were sat in the right, well, place, the right, right, right place, right time or wrong place, yeah. wrong time, you know, so <laughs> whichever way you're looking at it. So you told me that your, your friends and your family said, yes. you're crazy, why yeah. are you doing this? So yeah. Why did you do it when people around you were saying, well, there's a yeah. lot of risk, there's, yeah. uh, you know, you're taking on a, a lot of work there? Okay. Well, it's not unusual for my friends and family, first of all, to think I'm crazy. You know, that's just, okay. listen, but in this particular one, you know, look, as far as I'm concerned, you know, we've, we've, we're, we're experiencing this. We've been doing acquisitions uh, for a long time now. And I, I work on a very clear basis. When value is clear, decisions are easy. 
And for me, when we looked at the, the value in McGill that it still had, even though it had gone into administration, the structure of the deal that we were looking to propose to the administrator, it was an easy decision for me. And that's proven to be the case. So uh, what was the time scale that you had to work to? Because typically mm. buying from an administrator, the, the, yeah. the deal want, needs to be done very quickly. Yeah. You need to be a credible buyer yeah. in order to be taken seriously. Tell yeah. us what happened. Well, the administrator, I think the decision had already been made that they had uh, the business was going to fold and it was going to be a comp uh, an asset sale. The McGill name was going to disappear. Uh, they'd already made most of the staff redundant on day one. They kept a few just to do the wind up process. But it was almost there a 28 day plan to to, to do what they, the administrator had to do, sell the assets and uh, effectively remove themselves from the head office at McGill. We threw them a bit of a curveball in the sense that we were interested in acquiring the business and keeping it going or, st or, or starting it again. So so we were, we were in a hurry to do that. The, every day that there was a delay, uh, you know, was a potential, it was, it was um, devaluing, you know, the, the, the worth of the business and creating further problems and uncertainty. So we were in a hurry. Different to doing a normal transaction where they can drag on for months and months. When you're dealing with an administrator, absolutely that is not the case. There is clear deadlines and clear guidelines. And you have to be credible, you know. So w when we were going through the process, they had to do their due diligence on me and our companies and our businesses, and they needed to know that, and particularly given the profile of McGill at the time, they needed to know that they were dealing with someone that could do what he said he was, what was proposing Absolutely. to do. And, uh, you know, there was no way that administrators mm -hmm. would uh, compromise that. So they were very clear in their timelines. Um, and they, it was, you know, it was a tough time. We... So they went into administration on the 1st of February. We, uh, were, there was negotiations where they, they'd went out to various parties. We were announced as a preferred bidder round about the end of February. And we concluded we were given two weeks to, to either put up or shut up or do the deal effectively. And we, we concluded, I think it was the 13th of March. So a very short yes. window. And we're having to do all legal due diligence that you can that you can actually do on a on oh, which, is, which is limited isn't yeah it? it's limited and um, so but we had to get some sort of comfort so there was a absolutely a risk involved in it but like I say what you know when value is clear decisions are easy so that just keeps me on the straight and narrow and um, from from the noise of of of, uh, of people's opinions really so tell us from day one what happened so you mm. legally own the assets yes what happens then so well first of all we were not in the market for acquiring distressed companies that's not what we do normally but i knew this business we'd looked at it 18 months previously and like a lot of acquisitions you know you negotiations they might you might not agree a deal with you know the, the seller now but I mean, there's been many times over the years where they come back six, Absolutely. twelve, two years down yes. the road. So, so um, this one, uh, we we bought the business and uh, we bought the assets and we transferred. We bought the IP and we set up a new. There was a new entity set up to to effectively take all the good parts of the business and transfer them over. Mm -hmm. All the staff had been made redundant. And on day one, I was given a set of keys for this big head office building in Dundee. And, um, you know, I didn't know where the light switches were. I'm wandering about and what was that noise? And all of this stuff, you know, it was, it, was, it was literally like that 12 months ago. But I'd already had a plan in my mind. You know, we needed to, there was, we were, we'd, I'd made the decision. We weren't going to take any of the previous board of directors back. The people that were leading the ship, you know, if you like, when it mm -hmm. crashed, you know, the, it was, again, pretty easy decision for me. It was, uh, it was one or all. Uh, so it was all for one. And for me, it was none then, you know, we yes. were taking. Well, we because were, there's a reason why it went wrong. Absolutely. And the people at the helm yes. um, yep. had responsibility for that so maybe not the right people yeah to lead it to success absolutely and i think that i had various meetings with them during the due diligence process but it was clear to me pretty early on that uh we would i would be appointing a new board of directors so i had some uh, people teed up uh, to come into because we needed a good team of people this was not something i was capable of doing myself so the the during the before we we actually concluded 
I had our board teed up and lined up, mm -hmm. ready to hit the ground running, and that was a that was a that was a very critical and important part of this because to get a business the size of McGill back up running again pretty quickly and turn it around, we needed good good people on our team to do that, and uh, so so that was the first thing that we done. So we appointed a new board of directors. Yes. We we then quickly uh, went and revisited a number of the key customers and key clients. So a lot of that were lo local government contracts, housing associations, uh, really um, the, the ones that we wanted to have, the contracts that we wanted to get back on. Because there were a number of the contracts that were loss making, that were, you know, we didn't want back on them anyway. So it was, it was, it was really to identify the key ones. So first. part of your asset purchase were the contracts? Yes. Were they innovated? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, not all of them were innovated. We could have had them all innovated, but like I said, a number of them we so didn't you, want you, anyway. You cherry picked. We cherry picked. Yep. We cherry picked the ones that uh, made sense to us and in the new strategy that we were proposing for mm -hmm. McGill. So we cherry picked them. We innovated the contracts uh, across after we met with the customers, you know, and it was one of the, you know, obviously it was concerning for the customers, you know, what's happening, what, you know, they were, they were still in a bit of shock because this all kind of happened in a short period of time. But if you're on the other side of the fence as the customer, you immediately go into your, uh, you know, default, well, what's plan B here when this contractor goes bust? So a number of them had done that, uh, uh, the contracts, a number of contracts had been terminated, so we were. It was a race against the clock mm -hmm. to a certain extent. But where we got to was there was a number of contract uh, contracts that we got back on quickly. But you had to go through then the process of the innovation of those contracts as well, which take time. Then when you're dealing with uh, you know local authorities and housing associations, they need to go to committee to get the rubber stamped, and so things dragged on a wee bit in the early days. Now we're beyond that and uh, we've renewed some of the contracts on, on new four-year framework agreements and stuff. So so the whole thing's, but the, the initial stages was uh, very tight. So I went from appointing a board, uh, going going out to see the customers, agreeing that they would they wanted us back, we wanted to, to be back, then going through the innovation of some of the contracts, then staffing back up again, re-recruiting, re-employing some of the key staff to fulfil those roles. So um, it, it, it's uh, the process has been a great process because it allowed us to start with a fresh, clean yes. slate and go and, and if you like, cherry pick uh, the, the best contracts, absolutely. the best staff, the best... Yeah. So, so then I, you can match the staff to the contracts. Absolutely. And if some of those contracts were originally... Uh, we're making a loss. Then yes. you just you cherry pick the the ones that have the the, the brightest future. Uh, yes. Um, so you end up with really a, a a brand new incarnation of the business, don't that's, you? Yeah, and that's where we are at the moment. You know, it's one of these things that uh, we've been asked: should you have changed the business name? Should you have? You know, there's various customers have got different v views on mm -hmm. what an admi administration actually means. For us. It, it's a bit like, McGill's a bit like Marmite. You either like it or you don't. But there was value in the ones that liked it rather than going and trying to start again and, yeah. and almost change your name as if you're hiding something. Look, the business went into administration through no fault of the current board of directors or owners. Exactly. And we're in it with a completely different outlook, completely different view, and we're absolutely clear on our strategy. Yeah. But this is what I always say to, to the people that I, I work with, as you know, that the that the sins of the past can belong to the previous owners and previous management. Yes. And you are starting with a clean slate. Yeah. And, uh, and if people weren't happy with the service from the previous owners, well, that is in the past. Mm. This is the service that you're going to be receiving now from the, from the new owners. Yes. So without breaching any confidentiality, how was the deal structured? I mean, well, because quite often when people look at buying a business, they, they look at their personal bank account and they say, well, I can't afford it. Yeah. Uh, and that gets in their way from actually being successful at buying a business because they limit themselves according to how much free cash they have available that particular month. Yeah. So how did you approach this? Well. This was a, a mainly an asset sale. So we were buying the building, we were buying the equipment, we were buying the goodwill, the IP and the contracts, but the bulk of the value in it was in the real estate and the equipment. Well, that was all fundable, that was all financeable. Absolutely. So, and we were getting a, a, you know, a good deal on it, as far as I was concerned, uh, compared to the market rate of, 
you know, rather than it being a distressed value, if you put that to a, an actual working value of these assets, the value of the assets were greater than what we were buying them for. So the whole thing was, the was perfect scenario, isn't it? Well, well, for me it was. Yes, yeah. I think it was. <laughs> and of course, the administrators get their deal. They yes. return they return that money to the to the creditors, which of course is the their obligation to to do so. Yep. And you have something that you've bought for one price that's worth more. Yeah. And it's mm. quite easy to finance something when you're buying it yeah. below yep. the true market value. If you've got something tangible, like an asset, a building, uh, building mainly, but some 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 equipment also, it makes it uh, that you know that they, it's not as difficult if we were just trying to buy the IP or uh, the, the you know the goodwill Absolutely. of some of the contracts. That's very difficult to try and finance. But uh, when you have, when you have tangible assets, um, really. It's pr pretty straightforward stuff, really. Yes. You know? So it, it sounds like plain sailing, but it couldn't no. have been. I mean, there must have been, there must have been things that no. uh, no. Um, maybe uh, yep. meant that you're working late, burning the candle yep. at both ends, yep. and maybe having a few sleepless nights over. So give us a taste of some of the situations that yep. you had to deal with. Well, I think when you go through the, the early months and you're recruiting and you're kind of walking into the unknown, you know, you're, we're, we're, we're unsure as to what, you know, where the company's going to, how it's going to be accepted by customers again, what, you know, are we going to get any staff back? Um, so there was, a, there was a whole uncertainty around it. That itself creates stress and uh, anxiety, if you like. But, you know, I've been doing this a long time now and uh, that's, I kind of operate in those zones anyway. So, but it is stressful and it's difficult. And particularly when you're dealing with an administrator, there's no delays or anything. You have to be on your game. I mean, that was six weeks, really, of sleepless nights because and the deal could turn and change and twist mm -hmm. on a hat uh, you know and so for for that early process was a good uh, going through that actually set us up well for the rest of this year because we've just been we've had to be at it seven days a week we've bought a distressed business and we're trying to get the the wheels turning again and what was what was really important was it's okay me saying that because I'm used to that type of stuff. And my wife, we, we're used to that. We're seven days at this because we love it and that's what we do. But trying to get your staff to do that and senior staff yes. to do that. But we got a great team of people. You know, we were we appointed a good group of people. We didn't appoint everybody we met because some people just weren't up for it. And I could, you know, you can sense that just through experience. Mm. They weren't up for the task. This was a, we needed six months of their lives to start with, seven days a week. And that was, um, and some people just didn't have it. They just no, I mean, some it. people actually just want to work for a business and yes. turn, up, turn up every day yeah. without really putting any additional effort in. Yeah. And they, they don't want the rough parts. They just want the smooth parts. Yes. Yeah. And, and when you buy a business industry or buy a business from administrators, yeah, there's going to be a lot of effort and yeah. there's going to be some twists and turns, aren't there? Absolutely. And uh, so we were, we, were, we were selective in the, in the, the people that we recruited. Uh, at senior level and beyond now. So, so you know, as we, we, we go down the, the, the ranks, if you like, again, we've brought back the good guys, the guys that are up for it. And we, it's actually a great place to work. I really enjoy going in it, the positivity, because we know we're up against it. You know, we know we've had to get this thing uh, back running again. And the, the goodwill from the people has definitely helped us yes. uh, to get to where we are now. But we need to keep that and we need to you know, nurture it and we need to grow that. You can't that. take it for granted, can we you? We can't because the biggest fear that I have in all of this is that we become the same McGill that was, that was there before. Anything else, you know, I could, I could lose money, I could, we could, you know, things could go wrong, I can, you know, get beat, uh, you know, we make mistakes, I, I make many, but that would be the one, I think the one that really terrifies me is that we went and had a, this opportunity to have a, cre you know, a clean slate and we went and recreated the same thing that, yes. went, that went into administration. That's the... That's the so where do you feel you're going to end up then? Yep. And and really, I guess the question on, on people's minds would be, well, you bought the assets for a certain amount. Yep. You know, what's your return on investment going yep. to be over a period of time? Well, but, I mean, I, we always take a long term view at it. Um, I think we've done OK in the first year, given our turnover and, and we, we'll likely make a profit this first financial year. Now, in a distressed business, on a turnaround situation, starting from me walking in the building with a set of keys, 
That's and no people. No, no and nobody, nobody. <laughs> so we're just in. That, that's actually, I mean, I, I'm, I'm delighted about that. So there's already value being created in the company, but that's just the starting point. You know, we've got a three to five year plan. Certainly the first three years are critical for this business. So we, if we do the same again next year and the same the following year, that will take the business up to about 20 million. Now that might sound a lot, or for some people, but actually, in the scheme of things, we only need a few contracts to get to that level, the contracts that we want. So it's certainly not uh, beyond the realms of possibilities uh, for us to be able to achieve that. So it will, it will, I don't, we, we don't want to get to 45 million, you know, 400 staff that McGill was at before. It was uncontrollable on that in that business. The sweet spot in this industry is around 20 to 25 million. And there, if you look at and all the analysis that we've done on uh, either competing businesses or similar type businesses, that is the sweet spot where you can get the maximum efficiency uh, and you make the, you know, at that revenue and you can make the most profit and the business, it ch churns good. As soon as you go beyond that, there's additional cost put in, it starts getting a bit uncontrollable because of the scale of it. And, um, We've seen so many companies, even this year, since McGill went in administration, similar type businesses where the same, the same things happen to them. It just gets out of control. So for McGill only, I see that as taking a steady, uh, and I think it's a realistic and a sensible approach uh, to where we're at. We'll take five million this year, we th we'll do 10 next, and we reckon we'll get up to 20 the following year. So if you've created a success plan yeah. for this type of business in yep. this sector. Could you then apply that to other businesses? If others struggle as well, yeah. could could you do what you've just done again and again and again? Yeah. Well, I'm going to take you back then. So we looked at McGill 18 months before we actually bought it out of administration because it was always my intention or our intention that we uh, go and do a buying build. So a buying build in this sector. The sector is ripe for it. Uh, I think the opportunities are there for it. And we were looking for a platform company. McGill was distressed. It's probably knocked us back a year because we had to get McGill back up and running. But already we are acquiring other businesses. So we, we there was an acquisition we done just before uh, Christmas there that went through of a similar type business. We're engaged in legals and two others at the moment. These are not distressed businesses. And I'll be honest, we are not looking for distressed businesses. If a distressed business comes up because everything's, you know, you're looking that way and something comes and hits you here, we would probably look at it because we'd be plugging it into something. Yes, yeah, because when you've got that infrastructure, yes. it's a lot easier, isn't yeah, it? Because yeah. you've already got the management team, the staff. Yes. And um, you're not starting from scratch like no. you did with McGill's. No, no. So what's the end goal then? So a buy and build, mm -hmm. what are you going to end up with? And, and I guess there would be an exit at the end of that as well. Yeah, yeah. And how we exit or, or when we exit is debate is debatable, you know. So we're, there's no fixed timeline, but I reckon that within the next three to four years, we'll have a 300 million group of companies uh, right throughout the UK, and th at that level, but all of them, none of them operating beyond the 2025 20, million. Really focused on their own geography, uh, doing similar type, uh, working on similar type contracts, mainly government frameworks housing associations, NHS, those type of contracts. We, we're we not really into the speculative building or construction side. That's that's low margin stuff, uh, it's high risk, highly capital intensive. We really have, I think, the niche that we found ourselves in and that's the type of businesses that we're looking to acquire going forward. Very interesting. So for someone who hasn't bought a business before yep. um, and from uh, the, the, the conversations that we've had, what do you feel are the, the important elements for someone to think about and consider? Because I know some people just go into it blindly mm. and they use trial and error and hope that it's all going to work out. And quite often it doesn't. It crashes and burns. Yeah. So what do people need to consider to do this professionally? Well, first of all, it is, well, I mean, it's absolutely critical to have a good team of advisors. Uh, legal, uh, we, we only use the top legal firms 
Uh, now, uh, we've learnt the hard way. We've trial, trial and error it to death, you yes. know, and trying to save a shilling here and all that stuff. Yep. We've done all that stuff. We only use qualified, credible advisor for legal accounting, tax, you know, HR, all of this stuff. Now, we have a board of directors that cover those uh as, you know, those aspects, uh, you know, when we were first starting out, it was just me or it was me and my wife. But as we've grown and we really don't do anything now without the proper advice right at the start. The frustrations we get when we're looking at acquisitions is when the seller doesn't use a credible yes. or, a, or a real proper, but when they use, yeah. you know, their cousin's uncle that knows and, and someone. it always takes longer. Oh, it's horrendous. Um, <laughs> they, they get terrible advice yes. and uh, it can derail the deal, it, can't it? It absolutely does. It just adds unnecessary risk and uncertainty into all of it. So absolutely a firm of advisors, uh, 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 credible advisors are an important part of it. And the team, when we're looking at anything, it doesn't matter the size of the deal, who's the managing team? If I've got to go in there and manage it, it's put, you know, it's put me yeah. off, you know, because we, we're very clear on what it is. If they, they need to have a, at least a good second tier of management, what we what we tend to do is, if we're doing an acquisition, we'll tend to tie in the owners, the current owners, owner or owners, maybe for a short period of time, just to get us over that initial stages. And of course, when you're looking at how you, uh, you know, defer considerations and all that stuff, we make sure we tie them into that. So it's in their, you know, it's, what, it's in their interests to make sure Absolutely. they stay engaged for a period of time, depending on the size of the business, the type of business and all that stuff. So, but we, we, we that's important part for us. So who's the managing team? Because as we're buying and building and growing, we want good people. So actual fact, you know, people don't put a lot of value on the team and the people that are, that are in there. And if you take McGill, for example, I did not take in any of the senior managers, uh, senior directors at all. I brought in completely brand new industry professionals. They, and, me, and the appointments that we done when we were recruited, I made all of the, if you like, the tier two management, I made them up. So we gave them a, a lift. And every one of them, honestly, every one of them blossomed in the room. So they were inhibited by the previous management, yes. stale and all this stuff. That's often the way, stuff. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So do you, do you incentivise in any way at all? We do. We do. Uh, certainly the directors of the company will be equity sh uh, shareholders in the business. That was not even in anyone's thought really before. You know, you would have had to have been there 30 years or something before they'd give you, you know, 1% of the shares or anything. Not, no, absolutely we want these, the, the people that are involved in the business to really be a part of the business and be an equity shareholder in the business. So that's, that's uh, for me, it's incentive. It's different, you know, a lot of... Uh, a lot of owners just want to keep everything for themselves, you know, and uh, I don't believe in that myself. So if there was a, uh, a takeaway idea or concept or a piece of advice yep. that you could give people who are maybe starting out on yep. buying businesses, what would you say? I say don't buy from an administrator on your first year. <laughs> don't do that. You really need to be experienced uh, in doing that. I've, I, I think that... Um, where we are at the moment is that uh, there's never been a greater time or opportunity to buy a business. And a small business, you know, medium-sized business, it doesn't matter. I think where we are in the in the cycle of the world, and, I, and, and I, uh, what I mean by that is, in the next 10 year, 10 years, there will be 2 billion baby boomers retiring in the next 10 years. Almost a third of the population of the world Many of them will not have enough money in their pension, a number of them, so they will be either selling their houses, selling their, their businesses, uh, their, their, you know, their, their family don't want to take it over. There's just so much opportunity, potentially over the next 10 years, to, to, where, where people are looking to uh, sell their businesses. So if I, if, I, if I keep my business head on here, as opposed to the property side, I just see huge scope and potential. and. Uh, you know, to go in and buy an existing business that you can go in that's already established, already customer base, all this stuff, all that stuff. I just think that, um, you know, there are opportunities galore out there 
now and will be going forward. And um, I think if that's what you know, if that's what, what, what people are interested in, which they must be if they're watching this show, then um, they, I think that uh, it, they're, they're there and don't be afraid of it. You know, it's yeah. the only way to get in the game is to get in the game. Absolutely, you have to do that. And um, the sooner the, the sooner the better, because I've made many mistakes over the years. But we just, you know, we just keep going. Yeah, well, and, and some people procrastinate, don't they? So, yes. well, I, it's a great idea, yeah. but I'll I'll implement that great idea in a few years' yes. time. Yeah. Let's get started now. Yeah, yeah. Graham, thank yeah. you very much. If people want to get in touch with you, yeah. how do they do that? Check out our website, which is uh, united-capital.co.uk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, Graham. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel and tap the notification bell so that you receive an alert every time we upload a new video like this one. And also subscribe to my Business Buying Strategies podcast on iTunes. It's the most popular podcast in the world on buying a business. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.